get started. Awesome. Uh, just reminding folks that we are recording um, and uh, reminding folks that you can watch uh, this uh, back um, by going to our social medias and our website and we will post this there so you can rewatch it. My name is Just JP. I am a drag artist here in Boston, Massachusetts. I use any pronouns. And today I, I am so blessed and um, so excited to kick off this three days of amazing, amazing conversations by interviewing today, Vanessa. Uh, yay. All right, let's, let's clap everybody. Woo! It's hard to feel the energy on Zoom, but there you go. I see the claps. So Vanessa, why don't you um, get us started, uh, share your pronouns and a little bit of who you are. Yeah, so uh, my name is Vanessa Cordero and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a writer. Um, I, I really like writing science fiction, short fiction, um, even poetry occasionally. Um, and aside from that, I also work um, at a nonprofit in Boston. And so um, my title is, uh, I'm a program manager, but I also do a lot of advocacy. And so um, I've been working um, with survivors of violence um, for about seven years now. Um, and so it's, it's just been a really, really rewarding career. Um, and I feel like, you know, I, I try to kind of combine like social justice and resilience and survival, like with my writing a lot of the time. So it feels like a really, a really like perfect match. Thank you so much. I uh, have been really blessed to work with you in uh, different capacities throughout the years. So it's really exciting that we cross paths again uh, here in the art uh, of uh, queer art of resilience. Um, I want to remind folks that the chat is open. If you have any questions at any point, uh, please uh, drop it in the chat if you are here with us live. If you are watching on the rewatch, then I highly encourage you to again, follow us on our social medias and on our website. So you can be here with us the next time we do um, any type of content like this. So um, I am going to start us with our first question, if that's okay. Uh, you already mentioned the word resilience. So mm -hmm. I am going to ask if you can please um, tell us a little bit of your own definition of resilience. What does resilience mean to you? Yeah, so um, personally, and sometimes I have to stop myself and be like, okay, Vanessa, like, what does it mean to you other than like the kind of clinical definition or the definition like the way I would use it with my clients, for example. Um, to me, I feel like um, it's survival. Um, you know, I guess that's a broad kind of way to put it. Um, and for me personally, it feels like um, surviving interpersonal abuse as well as um, su surviving abuse from society. Um, I, you know, feel like I'm constantly, well, I have in the past, um, you know, been able to do both of those things. And so, um, to me, that makes me feel resilient. Um, I think at the same time too, like it's deeper than kind of just like, you know, knowing like, oh, I'm being resilient in this moment. I think that there's ways that I've had to be resilient that I'm not even conscious of. Um, so I think it, it can be something that is, um, you know, really deeply rooted. Um, and that could come from like my life experiences, um, my ancestors, and, you know, I think, even other places that I don't even even know about. Yeah, we. Um, I'm glad that you bring up ancestors, right? Because we usually hear a lot about like generational trauma and how there is a lot of um, trauma that we carry from mm -hmm. um, generations past. And I think it's also important to talk about uh, generational growth generational like resilience because a lot of the times um especially for us queer folks um or folks who identify within the lgbq and or t community um a lot of the times we hear like 
our queer history, our, um, and we hear, uh, or within our queer history, we listen to a lot of like the tribulations, like the difficulty, but we don't hear like the day to day, like how those people like were able to like build um, a lot of the, well, like building blocks to what we have now, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the foundational. So what does engaging that like um, generational resilience like, feels to you? I don't know if this question makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. And it's a really good question. And um, there's so much more I wish I could do. I wish I could sit down with my grandmother and my great grandmother um, and her grandmother. Um, and just, I, I, have, I have so many questions that I would ask. Um, you know, my abuela, um, my dad's mom passed away when I was about five years old. Um, and so one thing that I have from her that is really, really special to me is um, her earrings that I'm actually wearing today. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's amazing that I have something of hers. I feel so, so lucky. Um, and, you know, I think that like, also through food, I think is another way that I really can kind of connect um, with my abuela specifically too. Um, there's this um, Puerto Rican dish called cerullos or sorojito de maiz, it's also called. And um, it's like fried cornmeal sticks. And um, oh my God, they're so delicious and they're very hard to make. And a couple of years ago, of course, long after my grandmother passed, I learned how to make them. And so I feel, I feel connected to her in that way because it's like, I feel like she was guiding my hand with that. Like, and I feel those are like the kind of ways that I feel her presence. Um, and, you know, she, she was a very strong woman. Um, she, you know, came to um, the US from Puerto Rico in like the 1950s. Can't imagine that was easy. Um, she actually refused welfare when she got to the States. Um, so, which is like, you know, she, you have nothing and then you're refusing this help. Um, right. So, yeah, I think that there's small ways like that that I can feel, um, you know, that I can kind of, um, I guess, feel that resilience. Um, at the same time, there's so much more I wish I could do. I feel that loss all the time. Yeah. Um, it's great to have like little trinkets or um, heirlooms maybe, even if we don't call it like that, right? But mm -hmm. it is kind of like a family heirloom, right? And um, many times we um, connect with our ancestors, not through like physical things, mm -hmm. but through music, through food, mm -hmm. um, through celebration, um, sometimes through um, rituals as well. Um, so it's really interesting. And thank you so much for sharing um, a little bit of the connection that you have with your abuela. Um, how was, I, I just Googled um, sorullitos um, or sorullos de maíz, it's spelled S-O-R-U-L-L-O. -L -L mm -hmm. How was it? Because it looks, the, the, the recipe looks complicated. So how <laughs> was making it? Um, it? So the difficult part about it, it, it's easy in some sense, like all you need to do, you have, you need to have cornmeal and water and sugar and salt and like a little bit of butter. And so you put that all on the stove and then the cornmeal, it turns into this like batter almost, like a thick batter. And the difficult part about it is you have to um, wait till it's cooled just enough where you won't get super burned, but you're still gonna get burned. <laughs> and you have to, while it's warm, roll the cerullos um, into like a cigar type shape um, and then fry them. And so it's hard because if you don't do it right, they'll fall apart in the frying pan if they're too dry, they will crumble while you're trying to roll them. If they're too wet, they'll stick to the cutting board. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's definitely a process, but I feel like, you know, anyone can do it. I think if you put your mind to it, it's, it's, it's something that you can do like definitely with practice. And the first time I made them, I definitely didn't get it 100% correct. Um, so, but yeah, no, I've got it down to a science now. <laughs> Love that. And um, that also like shows a connection, right? Um, mm -hmm. To to your ancestors, like to your um, 
I don't know if this is the right word, please correct me, to like your motherland or like like the mm -hmm. place where you're from, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I said, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't know specifically like the context of that word. But yeah, mm -hmm. like it is a way of you connecting with um, what came before you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we have family uh, to be able to pass that along. And sometimes we don't have that, right? And we have mm -hmm. to go and find it ourselves. Um, can you tell us more about your abuela? Yeah, um, so she lived a really long life. Um, she passed away when she was like in her 90s, like mid to late 90s. Um, and again, I was I was five years old, so I was really young. Um, so it's not like she, you know, lived a short life and that's why I didn't get to grow up with her. Um, you know, my brothers um, and my cousins who are older than me um, did kind of get to grow up with her some more. So, you know, they they kind of got had more time with her, definitely. Um, and, you know, I know that she cooked really well. Um, I know that she um, was very protective of my dad and his brothers, like, you know, and, and they grew up in East Harlem. And so, at that time in like the 50s and 60s, it, it wasn't the safest environment. Mm -hmm. And so she would literally be like, you, you can't like after school, you got to come home and that's it. <laughs> Even in the summer sometimes, like she would really just try to um, protect them as much as she possibly could. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously showing a lot of love. Um, you know, and that's that's what's coming to mind right now. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know as much about her as as I would like to. And, you know, I, I kind of get my dad to, my dad doesn't like talk a whole lot about his past. I, I've had to kind of force it out of him a little bit because I'm nosy and I'm like, listen, like I need to know where I came from, okay? Um, but, you know, he, um, yeah, he basically like, said that she was very loving and a very, oh, and she also made a lot of pasteles, which um, are kind of like tamales, except they're um, made with a banana leaf and yuca instead of corn. Mm -hmm. And they took like, these things take days to make. And every holiday she would stay up all night with like all the neighbors in the building and like make them. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's what's coming to mind right now. I mean, I'm sure there's so many other things too that I don't even know that <laughs> are really amazing. Totally. I think when we're talking about resiliency, um, having that community around you, right, can be mm -hmm. super helpful because sometimes you feel like you're carrying things on your own and having that community can make it feel like there are people around you who mm -hmm. are also helping you carry that burden, right? Um, in many ways that we connect um, and make communities through food. Um, now, in the age of COVID, um, it's much more difficult, right? And uh, we are finding ways to create our own community, like this, for example, our mm -hmm. own little, little um, community around resiliency. So mm -hmm. I would like to follow up uh, or move along and ask you the next question that um, talks about um, a little bit of your childhood and you've shared a little bit uh, already, um, but what is that one first memory that you have um, where you had to be resilient? Even if you didn't know or use that word for that, but looking back is like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I really had to you know, push to survive and I survived. Yeah, so I can't think of a specific moment, um, but you know, I, I grew up in a house with abuse. And so um, I think that I remember just constantly growing up, um, you know, despite the chaos that was happening around me, despite feeling like I don't have control of my environment and of my own happiness, um, I kind of had to find a way to like develop my own internal world where, you know, I was okay, even though I wasn't um, on the outside. And so, um, you know, that, that is me, was me protecting myself. And I actually like, didn't really read as much as, as a young kid. I started reading more so in middle school, but in elementary and uh, 90s cartoons were so amazing and like profound and deep. And so I spent so much time watching cartoons like Rugrats or um, Hey Arnold, things like that as a child. 
Um, and that also kind of took me away to a place where I felt like I had more control and I was happy um, and, you know, just kind of enjoying myself. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that for me having to show resilience from a young age, yeah, I can't pin down, pin down a specific time, but um, it was definitely like an ongoing process that I kind of had to get better at over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, finding ways to cope, especially at home, is pretty mm -hmm. difficult. Because if we think about like, how will we define home, right? Uh, home is the place where we feel safe, where we feel welcome, where we feel loved, right? And um, in a household where abuse is present, um, that can sometimes pre be pretty difficult to find, um, to find those moments of like safety um, and find those moments of belonging, right? Um, Definitely. And like, so geographically, I grew up in upstate New York, which I shouldn't say upstate because my friends in, in New York would hurt me for that. <laughs> but like, um, I'm from the Hudson Valley. So it's like an hour north of the city. So it's that kind of weird in between like upstate and downstate. Um, but it, it, it was it was pretty rural parts of it. Um, and so it's like, I couldn't really just like get out easily, if that makes sense. I did have some like friends in my neighborhood that I would play with and that definitely was, you know, amazing <laughs> as a kid. But, um, you know, it was really once I started like getting older that I, I, in the summers or after school, I was always gone. And like, I didn't come back until late at night, like no matter what, because I that was also my way of kind of being resilient and just, trying to, you know, protect myself. Um, and it's hard too in upstate New York because um, it's cold in the winter. <laughs> and so like, I remember just hating the winters so much and I still hate winter. It's probably because of this, honestly, but like, you know, I couldn't just go out and walk around and leave. Like I was kind of trapped at home. Um, and so I love the summers. That's like my favorite time of the year. Um, and it makes me feel kind of like, you know, I have more freedom. Yeah, geography also plays a big role in uh, the ways that we survive, right? Because it's, weather is a thing and sometimes weather makes it difficult uh, for us to, um, for us to thrive and for us to be able to survive, definitely. Um, you mentioned like that there were, um, there were kids in the neighborhood that you would sometimes go out and play with. Um, um and um and sometimes that you would stay out late uh I wonder like um what's like a really good memory around that um and do you still keep in contact with any of those friends from childhood yeah wow oh my god um trying to think back I I do keep in contact um with with most of them um you know some of them are doing really great things and then some of them you know I, they've been kind of like struggling. And so it, it hasn't been as easy to kind of keep in contact with them, um, but I still love them. And I, you know, would love to, to be with them again and talk to them again and support them. Um, and so I guess a really good memory. Okay. I don't know if this is going to make sense to like anybody who didn't grow up in, in like a kind of rural type area, but um, there's this game called Manhunts. And so um, it's basically, and I think the rules of the, it's like hide and seek, but it's more intense. So like once you're found by the person who's trying to find everyone, you have to run from them. And if they touch you, you're out of the game. So it's like, it's like uh, hide and seek, but like way more intense. And so I just remember during the summers being out pretty late. And <laughs> I guess my parents just didn't care that I was out that late. Um, which was kind of a nice thing because I think that if they were a lot more strict, my life would have been a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we would just play manhunt until really late at night and it was summer, but it was kind of cool out because it was dark um, and just laughing and having fun and being active and out running like um, that. Though That's always something that I go back to when I think about um, that time with my friends I grew up with. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, somebody in the comments said like, yes, I love Manhunt. Um, <laughs> so if you uh, love Manhunt, then 
Snap, snap, snaps. Um, <laughs> it sounds like a combination between hide and seek and um, tag. Um, yes. Which like, don't get tagged. Otherwise, you know, <laughs> right. Lovely. Um, I want to shift, shift gears a little bit, Vanessa, and um, ask um, a question that we didn't prepare. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I want to share, I want to ask, first of all, if you can share a little bit around like the words that you use to um, describe yourself in regards of your sexuality and your mm -hmm. gender. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that, I think that the language I use for myself changes a lot. Um, you know, and, and I really haven't, I didn't understand that I was anything but straight until college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because like, I was always told by, I don't know, I guess by like kids growing up that like bisexuality isn't something that's like real. Mm -hmm. They were always like, oh, if you're like a girl and you're bisexual, you're actually straight and you're just like hooking up with girls because it's fun. Mm -hmm. So uh, that influenced me and I, I thought that that was true. So I had relationships with girls in high school and, you know, I, I didn't, I, I still was like, oh, I'm straight. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, it's, it doesn't mean anything emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, so I think that in I got to college and um, I saw other people who were queer, bisexual, um, lesbians and I was like okay this is kind of a thing <laughs> it sounds kind of silly but that's literally I didn't understand it that much until then um, and so I um, I think that I identify as queer because I think that that's just it's as vague as it can get you know I, I like that it's very general and I don't have to kind of feel as confined as like one specific thing um, and so I, I use that word to describe myself. If I'm talking with people who like aren't as familiar with the language queer, um, I, I sometimes just say bisexual, um, but the word that I prefer to use for myself is, is queer. And gender, um, I identify as a woman. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like that, that's not something that has really changed very much for me at all. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. And you already like answered a little bit of uh, the question <laughs> that I was going to ask next, which is um, how has been your relationship with those words, right? Um, mm -hmm. Talking about um, the words that we use around different people, it's super true, right? Because mm -hmm. um, there are some times in which we feel safer to share the word that we use for ourselves that really resonates, right? And there are other times in which we have to make those um, decisions of like, maybe I'm gonna use a different word and it is, mm -hmm. you know, because of circumstance. And another way of showing resilience, right? Is mm -hmm. being able um, to make those decisions. Yeah. Totally. Um, cool, awesome. And um, the next question that I would like to add, uh, ask, I'm sorry, is um, as you went along finding um, the word that really um, resonated for yourself, um, how was uh, that coming out um, or the continuously, again, like coming out is not like one mm -hmm. once and done, right? I guess, unless you're a celebrity um, <laughs> and everybody knows you. Um, but usually like coming out is a process, right? Um, so how has been uh, your coming out experiences? Maybe the first few coming out experiences compared to like now uh, when you share a little bit of yourself? Yeah, so I kind of like hate the idea that like I have to had to come out, which like is something that, you know, it has meaning in society, whether I like it or not. Mm -hmm. I, I despise it though. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that when I did started dating, when I started dating like women more seriously um, in college, like I, you know, I remember this one person that I dated and, you know, I was like, oh, my parents are probably going to be kind of surprised because they've really only known about me dating like men up until that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember just being like, you know, 
I don't really care what they think, <laughs> but at the same time, like I knew that, you know, I knew that they wouldn't disown me and that's a privilege that I didn't have to worry about it because I knew that it would be okay. And, you know, they've always given me a lot of like independence in my own choices. So, um, you know, I, I really wasn't that worried about it, um, but, you know, it was hard too, because I think that like the abusive person in, in my household, and again, I was kind of living at college, but also going back to that home, you know, there were just kind of comments that were made that were like, like, oh, okay, you can experiment. Like, that's fine. And I'm like, that's not what, that's not what's happening. <laughs> it's not like an experiment. Um, and, you know, I think that there are definitely things that and, you know, people that I feel like have tried to kind of like undermine who I am and who I want to be and who I feel like I am. Um, another part of resilience is kind of just, you know, not letting that completely change who you are. Um, so I, I've, I've tried really hard to do that. Thank you. Um, and you're a writer, you write stuff, right? Um, yeah. And I, um, I love, um, asking writers like their process, right? And how mm -hmm. they bring all of their experiences into their writing. So um, I would like to ask like, how do you get started with writing? And do you yeah. remember the first thing that you wrote that you were like, oh my God, I did this. I do actually, which is, I recognize is rare. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll talk about that first. These are great questions, by the way. I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so the, the first thing that I ever wrote that really felt like I was like, wow, I wrote a story. It was in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And we had this guy come in. He was like a storyteller. And so he came in and he told us some stories. I, I don't know where the stories came from. A lot of it was about like earth and the environment and things like that. Um, but basically the project after, um, you know, hearing from the storyteller was you had to write your own story. And I remember sitting there at my desk and you had to handwrite it. You know, we weren't using like computers necessarily at that time, um, you know, for that project. And it was just in class. And I remember writing a story about a witch Mm -hmm. um and it almost had Wizard of Oz Wizard of Oz vibes but like not completely and I can't remember all of the plot but basically it was just this tra the trajectory that this witch was taking on to do some sort of you know thing that she had to do I guess and I still remember how it felt to write that and that's why kids are so imaginative like you know I wish that I kind of really paid more attention to that as a kid and kind of tried to keep that more because I, I felt that when I was writing that, I felt it. Like I really, really felt it. I felt like I was there and it was, it was so comforting for me. It really felt like it was another way where I could kind of be in like my own world that I created. Um, and then I think the other question was about my writing process. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, so um, with my process, I feel like I'm learning a lot about that right now. Um, you know, I've been really interested in writing since I was a kid and only recently have I kind of been calling myself a writer. Um, I think that I really for a long time was like, you know, very self-conscious about it and telling myself like, well, you know, writing isn't practical as a career. Like I can't really do that. So, you know, I, I moved on to other, other things. Um, that's why I'm one of the reasons why I'm in the field I am now because I was like, I have to find something else. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I'm really trying to, I'm really like understanding now that that's not necessarily the case. And if I want to be a writer, I can, I just have to like do the work and fail a little bit and succeed a little bit too. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my process right now is, um, usually there's a triggering event in my life. I don't know if it's weird to call it like a triggering event. Cause it's not like necessarily a bad thing, but there's an event in my life where, usually I'll kind of think about that and I'm like, wow, that has some sort of meaning for me in some way. And then that will kind of develop into like my first draft of a story. Um, and so once I have the first draft and I second guess myself a lot. So I literally have to force myself to just write the draft and not think about how I'm saying anything. It's a lot of telling rather than showing at first um, and just get the ideas down. And then I go back and edit and editing I struggle with because 
it, 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 it stresses me out, I think. <laughs> I don't know, I'm trying to get to a point where I feel like I can edit my creative work more easily. When it's nonfiction, it's so much easier for some reason. I don't know why, maybe because that's more of what I'm, I'm used to because I wrote a lot of that in college. But, um, you know, um, I think that that's, that's my process. And sometimes I'll like light candles and stuff to try to feel focused, but I'm definitely not the kind of person that can kind of like plan, okay, I'll spend this amount of time writing. Um, it, that doesn't, that doesn't work for me. I kind of have to feel like into it in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, writing um, and getting in that mindset of um, being a vessel through which the story will pour out um, is a different process for everybody. And um, definitely, uh, it was really, I want to thank you for sharing a little bit of that, um, of your process. And um, you are somebody through the work that we've done that uh, I find that's very aware of uh, power and um, privilege and oppression. So um, how do you um, like check yourself or how do you like decolonize uh, the writings that you do? That is such a good question. Um, I'm still learning how to do that. And I think what I, I've, I've developed kind of like a group of people who I feel comfortable showing my writing to um, and so I think for me, it's just always feedback. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I have a writing group right now that I'm a part of that I feel like, and we're all um, people of color. And I feel like it's very helpful for me to kind of, um, you know, I, I'm not always, sometimes I get so in my head that it's like, I'm not necessarily thinking about the implications of like what I might be writing in that moment. Um, Cause I'm so like, just get the idea down. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think that I don't feel comfortable sending anything out into the world until, uh, you know, the people close to me have read it and have told me their thoughts. And, you know, I feel like it's, it's helpful in the sense, too, that they can kind of help check me and teach me more how to check myself. Um, and I've, I've learned a lot from, from that process. Totally. Thank you. Yeah. Um, integrating uh, folks that are close to you, right? And that, again community comes up again, right? Mm -hmm. um, what community are we um, cultivating? Because everybody, um, in a way, like everybody has their own community, right? We may be part of groups or we may be part of like a larger community, mm -hmm. but our personal communities, like the friends that we have, the partners, the family, right? Those are the people who really influence uh, what we do and what we put out as artists, right? Um, same with me, like I, I like showing the art that I do to my peers um, and it's important for me, for my peers uh, to not all look like me, right? To be mm -hmm. able to have all of those um, or have that feedback. Uh, feedback is such a, an important part uh, of a lot of artists' um, process. Definitely. And I think that like that's definitely changed for me over time because in the past, my idea of feedback was like, I need to get into an MFA program, <laughs> yeah. which is like, from what I've been told, like a group of white people just like kind of giving their feedback, which may be good or it may not be helpful. Like, I guess it depends, but it's like, um, you know, I, I, from what I've been told, there won't be, a, there wouldn't be a lot of people there who look like me. So um, you know, now I've become so much more aware of like, that's not what I want to do at all. And I would struggle there because, um, yeah, I just, I just feel like that's not the kind of feedback that I'm looking for. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to have the community that I have. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to, um, also remind folks who are here in the Zoom, thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, we're about halfway through. If you have any questions or if you would like to share any um, little um, of your own story and you feel inspired to, please drop it in the chat and um, we'll definitely incorporate it. And if you're watching on the rewatch, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I would like to talk a little bit more about community uh, mm -hmm. as we've been talking about community, I guess, for the past half hour uh, in many ways. Um, 
So how has, uh, what role has art and community um, played in your life and specifically now talking about um, in your current um, stage of your life um, and um, we can't ignore COVID um, as well. Mm -hmm. So how has, how have things changed, morphed um, and or like adapted uh, for you um, during this past couple months or few months, 11 months? Yeah, so I'll address that question first. Um, I actually started 21, 2021 by getting COVID, unfortunately. And, you know, I'm lucky that it was not a severe case. I didn't have to be hospitalized. I didn't even get like a fever or anything like that. Um, so, you know, but I have to say, like, without COVID happening, I, I, before COVID, I mean, it was this constant battle with myself where I'm like, I want to write, I have these ideas, I want to be creative, yet I don't have the time you know, um, commuting into Boston for work, um, back how traffic used to be before COVID, um, it would take me like 45 minutes and like an hour going back, which is ridiculous. I'm like nine miles away. Mm -hmm. um, and so like I, you know, once I started having to work from home, I, I had more time. And so that's actually what got me to a space where now I'm writing regularly and I'm learning how to kind of you know, be a writer and also do the other things that I have to do um, in my role at, at the nonprofit. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's, you know, it, it, I definitely, you know, took the experience and kind of was able to, I'm lucky that I, I started having more time and I could just write more and establish myself more. Mm -hmm. And what was the first question again? Yeah. Um, what role has art and community played in your life, um, especially recently? Yeah, yeah so um, a big role. Um, it's what I'm always thinking about, what I'm always wanting to do, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I think, you know, I, I spend a lot of time reading and writing, um, but I feel like, I feel so like, it, it makes me so happy when I get to like talk about my work with friends or people or like my community and also read their work and talk about it with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've learned more about being a writer from my community um, than anywhere else, really. Um, and so I think it's just, you know, my community, it's who I lean on for support. Um, and, you know, they, I'm lucky I have a lot of really great people in my life who validate me, right, and don't try to make me feel like, you know, you can't do this thing that you're trying to do. I mean, they're all very encouraging. And so, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for that. How has it been cultivating that, that group of friends or that community, um, highs and lows? Yeah, so um, highs, a couple of my friends who are on here now, um, I actually went to college with them and we lived in the same, in the same dorm building. Um, and so, you know, I feel like that was very easy and natural because, you know, we lived together essentially and we always could like go get dinner together and go on walks together and study together. Um, and, you know, I just feel like going to college and meeting the people that I got to meet and the people who I'm still in contact with has been one of the greatest experiences for me. Like I would have never met these friends without that experience. Um, I think the lows, um, it's definitely, I, I mean, I've had to cut people out of my life who, who really weren't like help, helpful in any way um, or, or who were just toxic, honestly. Um, and it's been a process of doing that. Um, you know, I definitely, over a year, a year and a half ago, I cut out um, the person in my life who, as I mentioned, um, who was abusive to me growing up, finally cut them out a year and a half ago. And that has, that has been helpful. Um, and yeah, there are definitely been other friendships that I've had to really kind of like, it's like I'm more intentional now about what I want in friendships. Um, and I hope my friends are too. And like, you know, really kind of, I, I wanna be what they need. And I also want my community to be, you know, what I need them to be as well. You talk about, oh, you just uh, talked a little bit about I feel like one of the most difficult processes in life, which is having to cut out people, yeah. especially people that 
mean a lot or have meant a lot, right? And um, there are times in which that is crucial for our growth, right? Um, to be able to to be able to grow, we have to leave things behind. We have to leave mm-hmm. people behind. Um, and I think that that's, um, that process of grief, of, of losing someone, um, can be super different uh, for a lot of people. So I would like, if it's okay, to give mm-hmm. you an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, grief, right? And how, how you grieve. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, by the way, I apologize. My roommates are like screaming downstairs. <laughs> They're okay though. Don't worry. I don't know if anyone can hear them. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think grief for me, it literally makes me feel like I'm dying. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that it has, and uh, my friends too, who are on this call and who kind of know, have seen me, you know, kind of losing people in different, different ways or having to let go of people. They, they, they know that and they've seen that like it really makes it makes me feel like I'm dying honestly and you know um I think it's a lot of anxiety and panicking I think that's kind of like what what makes it feel that way um and just feeling like you know I mean just a lot of loss I guess um and so I think that you know every time I've been, I've had to grieve over someone, I've always, you know, really been able to eventually kind of come to terms with it or feel at peace with it. But um, yeah, it's something that I'm going to be honest, I don't know how to deal with well. And I I, I would love to kind of get better at that. And uh, again, I'm so lucky because I have supportive friends. Um, but it's, it's hard. It is hard. Have writing helped you with grief in the past? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I feel like it's it's like a theme that I can go to and I can kind of really put my own words like from my brain onto the paper of, you know, how I felt during those experiences and how, you know, my characters who essentially like a lot of them, you know, in a sense are me, they come from me, like I built them, you know, how they, um, are talking about those situations and feeling about them. Totally. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, and thank you for being so vulnerable um, and also sharing um, the parts of yourself that may not be completely figured out, right? Because there's a lot of them. <laughs> right? Yeah, totally. I can relate to that too as well. And like, um, if the roles were reversed, I, I wouldn't know how to answer that question because sometimes I'm mm-hmm. like I don't even know myself right um so going into 2021 um how um uh, how do you feel about yourself and how do you see yourself being resilient in this new year well not so new mm-hmm. uh, but we can pretend it is new uh for you yeah <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I feel good going into this um, semi new year. I, um, I've made a commitment to myself that I really need to focus on my mental health um, this year. And so just really prioritizing it, um, making sure that I'm seeing all of the doctors I need to be seeing, um, getting on the medications I need to be on, um, you know, and, and I've been struggling with, and I, I'll always struggle with my mental health you know, and I've been struggling with it for a long time. And I think that it's something that, you know, I never really felt like I could get a lot of relief from from it. So I never tried, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, I'm just taking it more seriously now and trying to, you know, find better ways to cope with things and, you know, reframe situations um, and, you know, a more like like using less like cognitive distortions to understand things <laughs> like the black and white thinking and catastrophizing. Like I, I love doing that apparently. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm really trying to make that my focus as much as possible. Um, and I feel good going into the, the year, you know, I feel like, um, I feel like very optimistic about my future, which I think that like, you know, when I first moved to Boston, 
which was in 2017. And that's when I like left my home completely. Um, and I haven't lived there since uh, like where I grew up. And it was hard because I think I didn't necessarily know what direction my life was going to go in. Um, but I feel like I have a better understanding now of what I want and what I don't want. And I've learned that like what, knowing what you don't want is incredibly important. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I know now that I don't want um, roommates that will kind of not be good people. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I have learned what I want in my living situations. Living situations are incredibly touchy for me because of how I grew up. Um, I'm very sensitive to other people's moods. Um, so, you know, if my roommates are kind of upset, I'll be like, oh my God, what did I do? Kind of. Um, and so, you know, it's hard. And I think that like, I'm lucky because the people I live with now, they're very good at communicating. Um, and, you know, we all kind of uphold our responsibilities around the house. Um, and we're clear about what we want and what we need in the space. Um, you know, I've had roommates who like, I had one roommate who like, literally was trying to make ramen and like threw away the package of like the, you know, empty package, except it still had a lot of crumbled noodles on it. He didn't even throw it in the garbage. It like fell on the floor and he didn't even pick it up. Like disgusting things like that, <laughs> that I'm like, I definitely, like I, I need to get to know people. I need to like live with people who I intentionally um, are going to like, you know, be able to live with peacefully, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think in, in my job, in a job, um, I realized that I don't want to, I used to work um, in a shelter environment um, and it's really hard. I've worked in a couple different domestic violence shelters and I think that the shelter in New York I worked at, um, there was a lot of separation um, from like, you know, the staff and the um, survivors in the shelter. Unfortunately, I felt like at the shelter I worked at in Boston, um, it, it creates this culture of surveillance because your office is literally in somebody's living space. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I can't imagine like being in that position and, you know, surviving DV and getting like finally getting housed. And then you have these people who are just kind of always like monitoring you, you know, and you know that, um, yeah, you just know that they're there and kind of like, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. It, it's like, it's really hard to have boundaries in that environment. And I, I personally, I think that there needs to be shelter reform completely. I, I think that like what I've seen in DB shelters in Boston is really not okay. Um, and so, you know, I think that people should be able to live on their own. I don't think that they need staff surveilling the place 24 seven, you know, like I, I've learned that I don't want to be in that kind of position where I have to be the one to kind of, you know, I have to, there has to be that like power imbalance because of the nature of, you know, the role and literally like being someone of authority in the living space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. I hadn't even thought of it that way of, um, having surveillance, like having somebody who can make decisions whether you stay or not, being part of your living space. And yeah. And like, you know, I have to say, I, I respect everybody that, that works in DV shelters or any kind of shelter. Um, I think that, you know, I, I think that that work is really, really amazing and important. Um, so, you know, no disrespect to anybody like specifically, but I've personally just seen some really bad things in those, in those environments from staff. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, I mean, in general, like we need to start talking about housing differently. We need to start talking about housing as something that is a right. Um, there shouldn't be unhoused people. Um, yeah. I mean, there shouldn't, there shouldn't be unhoused people and there shouldn't be people who are, uh, or people who have to choose between like staying at home uh, and staying in a situation that uh, where abuse may be present or being unhoused, like that shouldn't happen. 
Um, so thank you for bringing that message today. Um, I wonder if um, all of like work experiences or things like that um, uh, show up in your writing or what you do, or if um, I guess the question is the silos, right? In your in your life, like how are things siloed in your life, and how do that um, interact with the art that you do? Yeah, so nonprofits are literally like circuses, <laughs> um, and so I feel like I yeah I've, I've worked on things that like are very much based in those settings and kind of. I don't know. I like to think that they're exposing kind of what it's really like to be in those environments. I think a lot of people think like, wow, you work at a nonprofit or you're an advocate, like, you know, that's awesome. Like, you know, which it is awesome. Um, but I think that they think that everything's just easy and supportive for the staff because the mission of the nonprofit is to support and uplift people. And that is not the case at all in a lot of places, um, you know, not all places, certainly. So, um, I, I'm experimenting with kind of writing about that a little bit. Um, and yeah, I think other parts of my life, I'm still trying to understand how to deal with race in my writing. You know, okay. I, like I, I'm still I'm trying to understand that. I still don't necessarily have a clear cut way where I feel like I can do that and feel, you know, like, oh, I have something here that it's, it sounds the way I want it to sound, you know, or it's. You know, I think that I grew up reading, you know, the like literary canon, like the classics. Um, and, you know, of course, a lot of that didn't include any anybody who had my experiences or looked like me. Um, and so that's what I became um, familiar with. And all of my stories up until um, a few years ago were about white people. <laughs> Not that I consciously was like, okay, this person's white. It was just more so like that was the standard I felt like, or subconsciously I felt like that, you know? Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm learning how to, how to do that more. I'm learning how to, um, you know, I, I think that there's, I think that it's complicated to kind of it's like I kind of have to create the foundation for how to write the way about the things I want to write about without having to see a lot of it around me first, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot about like, I've, I've, you know, read more books nowadays about like, you know, queer Latinas. Um, and, and that's been um, really great. Um, Christy C. Road, who's going to be on the panel tomorrow, she wrote, she's written some amazing work um, about her experience as a queer Latina growing up in Miami. Um, so cool. And um, yeah, no, I just think that like, I, I, I'm always learning how to do that. And it does at the same time make me angry that like, that wasn't necessarily an option in the beginning. Like I didn't kind of grow up getting to like, read other authors who weren't like, you know, right. Shakespeare, like whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our education system is white supremacist. Like it, mm -hmm. Like the books that we read uh, or the books that we tell our children um, or our younger folks to read um, don't accurately reflect everybody. Um, and even like the way that, um, even the way that sometimes um, institutions try to include um, writing that is not um, by and for uh, white people, it is not done in a way that is um, inclusive. It's done or, or respectful. It's done in a way that is still others, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's why it's really important for writers like you to um, put out your writing, right? Because it's, it's, um, it's, given people the opportunity to see themselves in stories uh, that they might not had before. Um, Chloe says on the chat, the colonizing writing is such an interesting topic, recognizing how mainstream American media centers whiteness 
and how that can insidiously seep into our own creations and imaginations. Such an important realization. Completely agree. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then like the intersection of like race and gender, right? And race and sexuality, like the way that um, we talk about, um, or similarly, the way that we talk about race, like a lot of things, um, a lot of writings that uh, we require our younger people to read in school are not representative um, of uh, LGBTQ and RT people, polyamorous people, people who do SM, um, I mean, people who live with HIV, like all mm -hmm. of those stories, like many stories aren't told. Um, so I would like to ask you, Vanessa, what has inspired you lately? Mm, okay. Um, <laughs> just laughing because of <laughs> Um, yeah, I get really, really inspired by science fiction, mm -hmm. um, you know, specifically science fiction, um, written by black and brown authors, um, like Octavia, Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I just love, um, thinking about identity, um, in relation to thinking about like other, other like physical worlds. Mm -hmm. um you know and so yeah I'm, I'm inspired by that and I did actually get a book the other day um it's it's about um it's like a book of short stories and it's called like Latinx science fiction or something like that and so I'm super excited for that and I'm already inspired even though I haven't read it yet um because it's like it's like I'm looking at is it at it as something that's enjoyable but also kind of like a blueprint of what like techniques or things that I can do in my my own work. Mm -hmm. Totally, absolutely. Um, what um, has made you happy lately? Oh, that's a good, that's a nice question. I like that. <laughs> um, what has made me happy lately? Um, I, I have been watching like movies with my dad every weekend over Zoom. <laughs> and we always pick like an 80s movie I don't know I growing up with him like I always he always had like 80s movies on and I actually like like a lot of them now mm -hmm. and so we'll just pick stuff from that time period and watch it on the weekends um you know and that's a good way to kind of stay connected with family because I can't really go over to New York right now and right. see them in person um yeah thinking about summer makes me happy <laughs> um it's definitely going to be coming soon um yeah, I think just like reading also makes me really happy. I think that like, and it happens a lot for me at the, like at the end of the day, especially cause I, I work Monday through Friday. Um, but like, it's, yeah, I feel like it's something where like time can kind of not really be relevant to me. And I can just focus on something that is about someone else's life, <laughs> I guess. It's, it's like, you know, I don't have to, do as much like you know I don't have to expend as much mental energy thinking about my own issues and it forces me to just kind of um learn from others honestly awesome thank you uh thank you for sharing um I like to always um end in a more like happy positive note uh, so thank you so much uh, for sharing all of that. Uh, Vanessa, uh, once more, I know we started with this, but I want to uh, give you the floor to share a little bit of what's coming uh, here in the Art of Queer Resilience for the rest of the weekend. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Okay, so um, tomorrow, um, as I mentioned, we have a panel that's going to be happening um, with Latinx writers. And so that's going to start at six o'clock. And it's going to be about an hour and 15 minutes. And so um, we just have some really, really, really amazing writers. Um, and so this kind of whole conference, um, Jer and I really had Gloria Anzaldúa in mind um, and, you know, her book um, about, you know, where she's talking about borderlands, right? What does that mean? Um, and La Facultad, like there's so many kind of really rich themes in there that just felt so appropriate to kind of like, you know, work with in this conference. So we're going to be talking a lot about kind of like 
intersecting identities, um, where cultures meet, right, where identities meet um, with these really amazing um, Latinx writers tomorrow. So I think it's going to be a really good discussion. Um, and there's also some of them also might do like a reading of their works, um, or like, you know, share a song or something. So that's really exciting. It's another reason to go tomorrow. Um, and then on Sunday, we're actually going to be doing, and it also starts at 6, at 6 p.m., we're going to be doing a community um, storytelling activity. And so that's going to be really, really awesome. And it is very like, you know, it's very, it's going to be like very participation focused. Um, but, you know, it, that is going to be really, I think it's going to be really fun. Yay. Awesome. So um, if you have not signed up for those, you should. Uh, and if you are watching this on the rewatch, sadly, you've missed those, but you can still um, watch uh, some, of, I'm assuming that the um, panel is going to be recorded and you can yes. watch it um, here in the Queer of Art Resilience and our website and through our social medias. Um, I'm not sure if the storytelling will be recorded, but if it is, you can also uh, watch it again here. And uh, I want to say thank you so, so much to you, Vanessa, for opening it up uh, so much about yourself and for sharing uh, with all of us. And thank you so much for also facilitating tomorrow. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this was really fun. I really, really believe in stories of survival. Um, and I'm so excited, um, you know, to just be to be doing this work with you all. Um, so definitely check out the Stories of Survival website if you haven't already. Um, there's a lot of really, really exciting things coming up for the future with Stories of Survival. So um, yeah, we will keep you all in the loop. Totally. Uh, I also want to say thank you to our sponsors, uh, Innovate at BU, uh, the Heretical Methodist Ministries, and all of our beloved viewers and supporters, everybody who is here on our call. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Kari, Louise, Liz, Allison, Kelly, Chloe, uh, Sonia, Tris, Charlene, Jer, uh, Erica, E. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here tonight. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Just JP. Uh, you can follow me on all social medias at DragQueenJP. And I will see you next time for another uh, installment of uh, the art of queer resilience or the queer art of resilience. I got it mixed up, but here we are. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, everyone.